You're listening to TIP. On today's episode, I sit down with Ashley Kerr to talk about how to build wealth from rental properties, all about property management, and how property management can actually be an advantage for new real estate investors. Ashley has a background in accounting, is a successful real estate investor herself, and also host of the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Rookie Podcast. I know I've learned a bunch from talking with Ashley, her social media accounts, and her podcast. So I'm sure you guys will all learn a ton from her story too. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode with Ashley Kerr. You're listening to Real Estate Investing by the Investors Podcast Network, where your host, Robert Leonard, interviews successful investors from various real estate investing niches to help educate you on your real estate investing journey. Hey, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of the Real Estate Investing Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Robert Leonard. And with me today, I have Ashley Kerr. Welcome to the show, Ashley. Hi, Robert. Thank you so much for having me. For those listening today that aren't familiar with you, tell us a bit about your background and how you got to where you are today. I'm currently the co-host of the Real Estate Rookie Podcast uh, put on by Bigger Pockets. And I started uh, investing in rental properties in 2014. And since then, I've grown my portfolio to 32 units just in Buffalo, New York. I I don't invest anywhere else right now. I live on a a dairy farm with my husband and my three boys. And I've kind of just built this uh, little rental business on the side, I guess. I work for an investor being a property manager for almost eight years. And I recently retired pretty much from that. I think you're being very modest when you say your small side (laughs) business with your real estate. And we'll dive into a lot of that. Like you said, you were working in in public accounting. Why do you want to get into real estate? There's a lot of different things that you could have invested in. So why specifically real estate? Well, when I worked in public accounting, I only lasted six months. I quit in the middle of tax season. I hated it. And that's when I transitioned to being a property manager for an investor. And it was basically property manager, his personal assistant. Um, I helped him start a couple of businesses. So lots of learning um, experience on different kinds of projects and stuff like that. But I saw what he was doing with you know, buying rental properties and having his investments. And he started to have me do a lot of his acquisitions. So I would find the property, negotiate the deal. I would get the financing on the property. So I learned a lot from that. And then just managing, I was managing two 40-unit apartment complexes. And I felt really comfortable with what I knew about real estate, you know, how to lease a unit and how to maintain it. So uh, that's when I actually approached his son and we bought our first property together as partners. What did that property look like? What was it? What was your first property? It was a duplex. It was in the town that uh, we both had grown up going to school in and knew the area very well, 40 unit apartment complexes in that same town. So I knew rents were going for what people wanted in apartments. And there was currently someone living in the downstairs and the upstairs was vacant and it needed, we put in new vinyl plank flooring, we painted it, and then we did uh, new kitchen cabinets and countertops in the unit. But his roommate, actually, my partner's roommate, he did all the work and he didn't have to pay my partner rent for, for a couple of months. So it worked out very well for me that I didn't have to pay anyone to do any labor. But we put together an LLC. We formed an LLC. He put up all the money to purchase the property. So it was a cash purchase. And we had a note payable to him from the LLC. So he every month he was getting a principal and interest payment. We were paying him 5.5% interest. And then he was also getting 50% of the cash flow. And so when you decided to leave your accounting job and go into property management, was that a strategic decision like, this is going to help me become a real estate investor and that's why I want to do it? Or was it kind of just, it was there, it was an opportunity, you didn't necessarily know what else you wanted to do, so you kind of just took it? Or was it more strategic? It definitely was not planned at all. I actually was quitting my job to be a stay-at-home mom. (laughs) My husband told me I could quit if I got pregnant. So I was like, okay. And I got pregnant, put in my two weeks notice, and I was just going to be a stay-at-home mom. And then the investor, I actually grew up with his daughter. So I'd known him for a very long time. And he said, you know, I just, I know you're not working right now. And I was just wondering if you could just help me. I just, 
need someone to help me get organized and to manage at the time he only had a 40 unit apartment complex or so health insurance, have that flexibility, work at home and get health insurance paid and then a little bit extra cash each week. That part time didn't last very long. It quick grew, you know, 50 to 60 hours a week. I definitely really enjoyed it and have learned so much from it. But it's funny how, you know, you look at opportunities and at the moment, like for me, it was the health insurance that got me. But I mean, it has grown me into a completely different person and definitely a lot of different opportunities have come up because of it. So if someone is relatively new to investing and they're considering whether or not they want to self-manage or hire a property manager... What do you generally recommend for a new investor? Should they do it themselves or should they start with a regular property manager? I'll be honest. I am so mixed on this because you always say do it yourself and you know how to pick a great property manager. Even if you are going to self-manage, put in the percent management fee or whatever the going rate is. If you ever want to give it to a property manager, your numbers still work. But recently, I gave up my property management in February and it has been great. I feel like relief is off my shoulders, but I think that I definitely have learned like over the years and I didn't realize how much of my time it took up was just learning the rules and the laws. And in New York state in the past year, they changed the, and there was just, I had to go to classes. I had to, to learn so much about these changing rules and some things weren't clear. And, and a lot of people have told me that the reason they use property management is because of the liability and just the fair housing laws. They don't want to have that responsibility of having to know all of these rules and regulations that come with being a landlord. So I think that's a great point. But if you're willing to learn and take the time to know these rules, regulations, and how to properly put together a lease, what you can and cannot put into a lease, and how to rent an apartment, I think if you can take the time to learn that stuff, then it is worth it to do it yourself at first to learn how to do it. It will make it a lot easier when you hire a property manager because you still have to oversee a property manager a little bit. Just you want to make sure that, you know, the money coming in is correct each month that you're getting, that you're not being overbilled for expenses. I mean, it's not a lot of work at all, but you want to make sure your property manager is is doing things right. Was there a point or a number of units where you hit and you were like, this is kind of snowballing and now it's a lot of work? You know, maybe you could get to five units and it's not so bad or 10 units even. And then you hit that point and you're like, now I need a property manager. Well, I was actually self-managing 80 units for this investor all by myself. And then at that time, I probably had maybe 12 units myself. Like, (laughs) it drove me crazy. So at that, I was at about 92 units and I hired a leasing agent to help me. And then from then, I had a couple part-time people helping me ever since then. So that was about three years ago. But I had gone two years without having when I did those 92 units for two years, I self-managed them. But that was also my full-time job. I mean, I was you know, working 50 to 60 hours a week managing those units, doing everything for them. So if you're, this is you know, real estate investing, you want it to be part-time job or passive and not a full-time job, I would give it up after 15 units of your own if you don't want it to take up a ton of your time. Because I was working for this other investor I was already doing property management every day. So it wasn't a big deal to, to have my own properties included in that. If someone's going to manage it themselves, what items are often overlooked by new rental property owners that would have been caught by someone like yourself who has a bit more experience or just other more experienced property management companies? Well, I think one big thing would have to be just like a checklist. Okay, You want to have your, your application checklist of credit ref background checks, credit checks, and just you want to have a really, really good systems in place. And these, when I first started working for a property manager, I was just given boxes and files and like keys in a drawer and I had to create all my own systems. And I think that, you know, that the leasing process can be one of the the hardest things to do. It's if you want to get a good tenant in place. And like, you know, some people go as far as creating like manuals for each home that show how the home is supposed to be taken care of and what you need to do to operate the home. You know, like every manual for the fridge is still, you know, included in there if you ever needed to reference it. But I I think for me, it was I learned a lot about the leasing process and like how to actually legally process applications and select a resident fairly 
without, oh, here, this is my friend. I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> but, um, and I think that's where you can get into the most trouble is as a landlord as during the leasing process for sure. For what I do, it sounds like it might be like a hybrid model because I use an agent to help me with leasing. So they do all the showings, they handle even procuring a lot of the tenant potential tenants, and then I get all the applications and I'll look through them and make the decision. But they're... And again, this is long distance. So I'm not even in the, at the property to even show it even if I wanted to. They have to do that for me. But I have an agent who does that. They're, they're there, shows the property for me. But then once that's done and the tenant is in and they've gone through the move in and move out checklist with the agent, everything else, all the other property management stuff is on me. Great solution. Or you know, just even... I think with real estate, there's a lot of stuff that you can easily outsource. And that's a great way to do it because there's so much software right now for you to easily property manage remotely. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say is the software piece of it. It it just makes my life so much easier. But basically, I just use Cozy for pretty much everything. And I think that's a great point is that you can easily hire a leasing agent to do it. I have done that before. I found a lot of just... You can't just hire a realtor to do it. I I hired one commercial property and she didn't even run a credit check or background check. She's just like, these people want it and they're willing to pay. Here you go. Where's my commission? <laughs> I'm like, well, no, we need to like go through a process. Like, We just can't tell them they have it because they want it. So definitely people have to be careful in their selection of who's going to be leasing their unit. Yeah. That's where an investor-friendly agent would come in handy, which is what I look for as someone who has their own rentals. And in this case, he helps me purchase the properties down there. And he's also an investor himself. So he knows kind of what's going on. And then again, going back to Cozy is he just kind of gets me the the applicants. And then once they go into Cozy and they actually apply, that runs their background check and credit checks automatically for me. So I don't even have to worry about that. Yeah, that's great. If someone doesn't want to do the self-managing route and they're going to hire a property manager, what do they need to look for? What are some of those characteristics or things that really make for a great property manager? I would say one that's willing to work 24 <laughs> seven, you know, someone who's not going to just work nine to five and, you know, will be available evenings and weekends. That's one thing that's been hard for me in the transition is that, you know, I was pretty much available anytime. I did set like limitations on my voicemail. It said, you know, I'm available during the week, this time or whatever, but like I would always listen to my voicemail. And if there was something, you know, emergent, or if I was sent an email, like even if it was a Saturday morning, I would just respond or whatever. But now that I actually have a property management company, it's been a big change that like if I send an email on Friday at five, you know, it doesn't get responded to until, you know, Monday at 8 a.m., which it's just, it's hard for me to do that because I've just like was always just in property management mode, which is nice now to not have to do that. But I think if you really want a a great property manager, it's someone who is going to value your properties and knows what they're doing. But will also, you don't want them to, I don't know, give in to everything that you want. You want someone to be comfortable giving you advice, should be able to give you advice as to how to handle a situation and not just be like, oh, well, you know, whatever you want to do, we'll do. You know, you're you're hiring them to manage the property. You want them to be able to make decisions, you know, that will be best for you and the property because you don't want to have to worry about it and you don't want to have to know what's best. That's why you why you pay them. So looking for someone who's not going to be afraid to give you guidance and to tell you that you're wrong. <laughs> so how do you go about finding somebody that meets all of those different things that you just mentioned? I went through like a lot of leasing agency because I'm so picky. <laughs> And finally, my boss's daughter started working for me. And since, you know, they were her dad's property, she cared about them so much that that's why I was able to work well with her because she cared about the properties. And then when I hired this property management company, I actually interviewed them for about four months before I actually hired them and pulled the trigger. I walked properties with them. I got references from them. I sat down in meetings with them and I just felt comfortable. The one property manager was actually dating a friend of my husband's. And I like that I kind of had like a personal connection there. And then I actually know one of the maintenance coordinators and she gave me some very honest feedback about the place. And that's why I decided to go with them. But I I liked how they were very, I guess, 
very open on social media. Like they had a, a good social media following, which sounds weird, but like it would be so easy for if someone wasn't on or if someone was unhappy with them to just like post on all of their social media, like this place sucks, we're not getting maintenance done or no one returns our calls or they like I'm an owner of a property and they neglected to rent it. I think that's really important that it's so easy these days for if someone's unhappy with something to put negative reviews out there if people have social media and they really don't have any negative reviews at all. Yeah. So there's a lot of resources these days that you can use to get those types of reviews. Yelp, Home Advisor. I mean, there's tons and tons and tons of different ones that you could use to get those reviews. And that's one of the things I do, not just for property managers, but for handymen, you know, anything, contractors, things like that. And it's not, I don't use ones that have just like two or three. You know, you need to have a good sample size to go from and, and get a general feel for what their quality of work is. I had this guy tell me once that if, you know, if he was driving somewhere or whatever and he saw like a contractor sign in the yard or like their truck in someone's driveway, he would actually go and knock on their door and say, you know, I saw this, you know, contractor is doing work right now or was, you know, do you mind giving me some feedback? I'm always looking for <laughs> new contractors. I don't know if I'm that brave to actually just go knock on someone's door, but I thought that was very interesting and actually a good technique. And then like if the the contractors were there working on the project or like it wasn't complete, he would give his name and phone number to the homeowner and ask if they wouldn't mind calling him to let him know if they did a good job or not. And he said, you know, they did a great job. People don't mind taking a couple minutes to rave about how great it was. And if they did a horrible job, they definitely want to get that off their shoulders and they'll have no problem calling him to tell him it was a bad job. He said if it was a mediocre job, then maybe he wouldn't hear anything back. But he's like, I'm looking for great people. So if they call me and tell me they're great, you know, I'll definitely look into using them. Yeah, I've actually heard that same advice from a couple other people as well. And I haven't used it myself. I don't do a lot of stuff locally. So it's not super easy for me just because even if I see something around here and, and I go talk to them, it's not going to be helpful for me. But like you, I don't know if I'd be brave enough to go knock on the door and talk to someone that's yeah. <laughs> not necessarily in my, my personality type. But yeah, no, it definitely could be a really good strategy. I know not too long ago, you, you became a licensed insurance agent as well. What was your thought process behind that? And how has it impacted your real estate investing business? Well, that was actually with the investor that I work for. He wanted to start an insurance agency. He's been licensed for like 25 years. And he held his license and your insurance broker. And um, he just decided that, you know, he'd actually like to start one. <laughs> so me and him started an insurance agency. And uh, so he's like, well, you need to go get your license. And I went and got my license. I went to like school for three weeks. Definitely a big change of not having <laughs> been in school, a school for a long time, <laughs> having to go and sit from eight to five every day for three weeks. But yeah, I got my property and casualty insurance, and then also a home and auto. So I can pretty much write anything, life insurance too, and health insurance. So uh, we started this agency and I hold my license there and I write all of his commercial and residential properties. And then I do all of my own too. And then I'll do rental properties primarily for other investors in the area. I don't really do any home or auto, but it definitely is very nice to get that commission check uh, from writing my own policies and from writing, you know, his units and then um, other investors too. So I just kind of focus on that small little niche since I'm not doing it a lot, but it's been good. And I always tell people that like, if you don't want to be a realtor or a property manager or something like that, like getting your insurance license is another way to introduce yourself to being part of real estate investing because you're learning about the property. Some things I have learned is you don't want the property to have a trampoline. You don't want it to have a pool. You don't want it to have a wood stove. You know, just those are three general things that whole, like your insurance company is going to frown upon and either say, no, we're not going to give you coverage or we're going to increase your coverage. So it's been very interesting to learn the different things and about what goes into them underwriting a policy and if they're going to write it or not. So I, I've liked to. Uh, that part of it. And then it's also kind of fun when you like input all the information and you see the, the number pop up, <laughs> you know, what the preview is going to be. And if you beat the, you know, the person's current policy or whatever. But yeah, I, I think it's a good way to get to know more about properties, especially if you're going to do rental properties, 
running, when people run their numbers, I feel like insurance is one of the hardest things to estimate because, you know, it's not readily available for you because it really depends on who you are as the owner and what the property type is. Just because the previous owner, you know, is paying 800 doesn't mean that you're going to be paying $800 a month. They might have that bundled into, you know, their primary residence, their auto, a boat where they're getting like a huge discount. Where are you going in, you know, being a first, you don't even own a home. This is your first time getting insurance. Maybe you have car insurance, but you can't bundle it or whatever it may be. Um, It could be very different for you. So it's very easy for me to quote, you know, buildings that I'm looking at for myself. I just put it into the website and see what it would be. And I just don't submit it, but I can use that to get a pretty much an exact number on what my insurance estimate would be for that property. You mentioned a couple of the different things that you've learned to look out for being trampolines, fireplaces, things like that. And one of the common questions people get or have is about pets for tenants in rentals. How does that play into an insurance product if it's going to be a rental? Yeah, that is a great question. For the company I work with specifically, they require your tenants to have rental insurance if they have any kind of pet, even a cat. And then if they if it is, they have breed restrictions too, where if it is Pitbull, Rottweiler, and I think there's one more, they won't even write the policy. And you also mentioned the commission, which I think is really interesting because that's not a component that I had thought of myself, but I actually hold my real estate agent license in the state where I live. And I use that not because I practice, I don't practice by, by any means, but I use it to help my real estate investing. And I also am able to earn commissions, you know, referral commissions by telling people I know to go with a certain agent and get a commission that way. And then, of course, commissions on everything that I purchase or sell myself. So that has been a nice component. And I think a lot of people know of that, but not a lot of people know of the insurance side of things. Does it work similar? Yeah, except you're getting renewal commission every single year. So like, say for a $1,000 policy, the agency, the brokerage will probably make 20 of that $1,000. And then, um, so how it's set up for me is, so they get $200 when they first write that, when I first write that policy, and then they give me 60% of that. So I make that the first year. Well, then every year it renews, the company pays another 10% to my agency. And then I get, I think it's 10% of that. So it's not a huge amount of money, but still it's like, oh, I had a couple of insurance policies renew this month. Here's, you know, another hundred bucks (laughs) or whatever. Um, So it's kind of fun having, and I mean, if you wrote a lot of policies, like the apartment complexes, I mean, those are like $14,000 policies for the year. So that's a little more than a hundred bucks that I'm getting each year, but it can definitely add up and it's just renewal income because you need insurance every single year. And no, I'll glance over like for people who are actual customers, I'll glance over their policies, make sure that, you know, everything is still correct this year. If we need to change anything, if they're eligible for a discount or we can get it a little bit cheaper, but at least, you know, it's not a ton of work at all to keep getting that renewal commission. So for something like that, do you have to be an actual practicing insurance agent at a firm or brokerage? Or can you just be licensed and say, oh, I know so-and-so that's going to get an insurance policy. I refer them to a different agency, say State Farm or Progressive or something, and then get a commission? Or how exactly does that work? You can have that brokerage hold your license and then do a referral. So the agency that the brokerage that holds my license, there is a another person that she doesn't do any writing or anything like that. And she just, every person she refers, she gets a, a 10% one-time commission, but no renewal commission. And the same with me. If I refer someone for like their auto or their primary residence, which I don't really write, I get 10% that first year. Yeah. So that sounds exactly like how it works with the real estate license side of things. Easy to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's super easy. <laughs> It's super yeah. easy. It's one of the things I like. I, I forget exactly how much it was to get my license. It was a couple hundred dollars, under $500, yeah. I believe. And the numbers are on the payouts for a referral are, are bigger on the real estate side, I think, because when mm-hmm. I refer someone, I generally get between 20 and 30% of whatever that agent's commission is. So just say the agent's commission is 10000 you can get 2000 to $3,000, give or take, for one referral, and you could continue to do that. And if your license only costs you $500 or less to get, then I mean, that's one deal and you've made five, six times your money back, which is great. 
And that's what and happens. And it's just with connecting people. Yeah, just you connecting know? people. That's all you have to do. Yeah. Yeah, just connecting people. I mean, and it was as easy as I had a friend's mom that was going to buy a property. And I said, oh, hey, you know, here's an agent that I know. I know him really well. Yeah. I trust him. You know, if you want to use him, go ahead. If not, that's fine. He ended up using him. And then, of course, there was a commission and it made a very good return on that $500 investment. Now, the, the caveat right. to that is it's hard to get someone to hold your license to do just that. Because yeah. no, most brokerages don't want you to hold your license just to do that. Just like insurance, they have a lot of liability. So you kind of have to have an in almost to be able to do that, but, but it does work. That's really interesting. And I guess with my license, the investor paid for me to get it. So I didn't have any upfront costs there. But since he paid for my license, he's not going to want me to leave and hold it somewhere else. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, I want to dive into more about your investing Based on what I read, is about five years or so you added 30 units to your own portfolio. How did you find? We talked about it earlier, but I want to dive into your first deal a little bit more. And then how did you scale from there without much of your own money? So I had the partner that put up the cash for the first property. And then he actually had some more cash. So we bought a second property and we actually refinanced and did a portfolio loan on both of them to buy our third property. And then after that, He did a line of credit on his house and we purchased our fourth property and then put a a mortgage on that third property, paid off his line of credit again. So we kind of just basically did the burr strategy, but we really weren't doing any rehab. So property two, three, and four needed no work to them at all. And then we had just done some cosmetic updates to that, that first unit. And then um, after that, I found a bigger pockets. And from there, it just like accelerated. <laughs> I was just like learning different ways to find deals and get money. And I just was also so pumped up from like learning about this community of other investors because before it basically just bent me, even my partner, he was 100% passive. He knew like nothing and he still doesn't really know anything about finding a property or like talking the numbers on it and stuff. And He's busy with his own passions and stuff that he doesn't really care as long as I'm making him money. But I think I just really was so motivated by finding this bigger pockets community. And like within a year and a half, I tripled my portfolio after I found bigger pockets. So property five, I purchased on my own. It was the first property I'd purchased on my own. I did 20% down, 30 year financing and a fixed rate. And then after that, I found another partner. And uh, since then, we've bought a duplex and a triplex and a four unit together. And we have another single family under contract. And then I purchased a bunch more on my own and some more with my first partner. But it was just, I I got a lot more confident and a lot more excited. And I started to really see the power of what that cash flow can do. And I started to use it to buy more properties. When do you think someone is ready to bring on a money partner? Do they have to do maybe a few deals successfully on their own first before they bring in private capital? I don't think so. You just have to be able to prove yourself to that person and make them realize that this is an opportunity for them. So I always like to suggest putting together a binder with all of your personal financial information. When I started real estate investing, like my finances were not like in order. And then I found like, Dave Ramsey, and now we're debt free besides our rental properties. And, you know, life is amazing, but I think it's so important. My rental properties wouldn't be as successful as they are now if I didn't learn how to manage my own money first. And then, you know, now I manage the rental properties money very successfully. But I think it's very important to have your own finances in order if you want your rental business to be successful and you want to build wealth. So I think that's a good foundation to start. So I recommend putting together like a binder portfolio with a couple of years of your personal tax returns, your personal financial statement, maybe, you know, maybe a couple of bank statements. That's one thing you're going to be tying yourself to this person and they want to make sure they're tying their, their self with someone and giving their money to someone who can manage their own money. Even a, a credit karma report of what your credit is like showing that you paid your bills on time. I think that's really important. And then show them a couple deals. You can get do the bigger pockets calculator reports and print those off, just showing like, okay, this is what I want to purchase this property for. This is what the rehab would cost. Include pictures, show, you know, include estimates from contractors showing like 
I know the rehab will cost this. I had contractors walk through with me. These are the costs of that. And just give them as much information as you can show and say, look at this is how I would pay you back. This is what the cash flow would be. And, you know, I have this amount of money in reserves. Even though I'm using your own money, I still have, you know, 10 grand in reserves that if something were to happen, I can pull that money. I'm just anything you have to show them that you would be a reliable partner and exactly how their their money would be safe. Just give them as much information as you can. But I don't think that you have to have a couple of deals. I think it makes it a lot easier to find a money partner once you do have a couple of deals. So you can add that to your your binder, showing them what you have already done, what you're cash flowing now, and how you turn those into successful deals. The personal finance component of that is really interesting. I've never heard someone recommend putting that information together and providing it to an investor, but I think it makes great sense. And I think that is a great idea. Do you find that a lot of investors, they don't necessarily care how much money you have, rather how you handle the money? I think that's such a you know important aspect because you, someone could, and I look at it like I'm a big fan of debt-free. I was talking about like you could be spending a million and a half dollars a year. And, but you could make $40,000 a year and only spending $20,000 a year. And that's because you're living below your means and you know how to manage your money. And I think that it can, once someone starts getting this cash flow in, you know, it's, you know, could be pretty much passive income. And if you're not managing that income, it can be pretty easy to start spending that money and living out of your means and not saving for reserves or, you know, saving for that roof job that's going to come up in a couple of years. So you can easily get yourself in trouble, you know, once you start, someone starts making more money and, but you still have an asset that you have to manage, maintain and take care of. So I think it's, it's very important that you have your own finances in order because what if an emergency does come up, you know, and you need to spend beyond your cash reserves, would you be able to pull money from, you know, like for us, for our farm, like we would be, we're in a position now that if we needed to, we could pull. $4,000 $4,000 a month out of my husband's farm income to put on a new roof or something like that. If for some reason our cash reserves wasn't enough for some big emergency or you know we needed to do six roofs in one month or something. But I think the two go hand in hand, your, your personal finances and your business finances. Yeah. I think a lot of people would hear that personal finance advice and then just kind of get concerned, not concerned, but self-conscious and just say, well, I don't have a lot of money. I don't want to show an investor that. But then you have to remember is that's the point. They already know that you're not going to have a lot of money. That's why you're going to them is to be your money partner. You know, They're not going to expect you to have $100,000 sitting in the bank. And I mean, the other component of it is there's a saying of if you can't manage your money when you make $25,000 a year, you're not going to be able to manage your money when you have $100,000 a year, $500,000 a year. So it's the same thing, just like you were saying, is if you can't manage your own money, whether it's you're making fifty dollars or $100,000 a year, you're not going to be able to manage a, a asset that's making cash flow. So you need to be able to have that money management piece under control. Right. And I think that's why it's important to show as much as you can, because you're right. It's not about like a dollar amount, how much money you have. It's about showing that you can manage what you do have. So like showing your tax return will show how much you make. Showing, you know, your credit report will show that you pay your bills on time and showing your personal financial statement will show that you're not, you don't have a ton of debt on a boat, car and stuff like that. And that you you don't live outside of your means and have a small net worth that, you know, you're able to show that you, that that's important to you is that you want to build wealth. And you're right that most people who need a money partner, it's because they don't have a ton of money. And I think a lot of people who are willing to invest their money know that. And someone who doesn't have a lot of money might be a lot eager, you know, more eager to to make money for both of you. Like I would rather invest with someone who's, you know, if I'm gonna be a passive investor, give them my money who doesn't have a lot of money because they're probably gonna be more likely to make that money work hard so that they can make their own money rather than someone who already has a lot of money and is just like, oh, well, this is just, you know, oh, well, we lost $500 this month. I, you know, didn't bid out contractors, but whatever, it's just $500. So I think that could even be an advantage to you that you can show them that you're eager to work hard to make money for both of you. Yeah, that's a really good point. How do you go about finding someone like this? If somebody's listening today, they're going to do everything that you've just mentioned about the personal finances. They're going to put it in a binder. They're willing to have that conversation. But now they're thinking, how do I even get in front of these people? Who do I even give this binder to? So my first partner was like a lifelong friend. And I just kept putting the bug in his ear, like, look at your 
dad is doing this, you know, we should do it too. So if you know anyone whose parents have been successful from real estate, but maybe they don't have the time, their parents don't have the time to teach them how to do it or something like that, try approaching someone like that. And then I, my second partner, we actually were friends for like two years and he had some of his own rental properties. And we decided to partner and we work really well together. And I think it was really important that we built our friendship first and that we each had experience with, you know, our own rentals. And we have the same kind of mindset. We buy the same kind of properties. We want to do the same things with our properties. So I think the fact that we watched each other for different paths, but they were actually very similar has really helped us grow, a, you know, a strong foundation for the partnership that we have now. And then I would just talk to people who you are comfortable with. So I've had uh, like another person that wanted to invest with me and I just, I wasn't ready for another partner. So we never did anything with it at the time. But my realtor had actually approached me and said, you know, I I have this friend, he wants to get in real estate investing, he has money, but he doesn't have time and he doesn't want to deal with the property, the property management. So I actually met with him for coffee, gave him, you know, my binder with all the information in it. We went over it and we went and looked at a couple properties together. We almost put in an offer on one and then I just kind of dropped the ball on it. I wasn't ready, but I I think that at any time I could go back to him and I think he would definitely still be interested in doing something. So maybe reach out to people who you are comfortable with and maybe even if it's someone you think might actually be interested in doing it, but you just don't want to ask them, just say, hey, I was just, you know, I know, you know, you know, a lot of people, do you know anyone that would be interested in investing money with me to, to buy a property or I'm looking for an investor? Do you know of anyone? And, you know, maybe they'll, you know, think of someone like, Hey, I heard someone talking about this the other day that they want to get in real estate, but they don't know how to, and they have the money or they might say, Oh, you know what? Actually I would like to, or, you know, maybe a month later they'll call you and say, Hey, so-and-so was just talking about real estate investing. I gave them your information, you know, they should call you and stuff like that. So I think word of mouth referrals are really powerful. That's how I found like half of my properties is because people came to me and said, Hey, I know this person that's selling their building or you know what? I need to get rid of these, these properties. Me and my sister are fighting over them and we just need to be done with them. And so I, I think just telling people what, you know, what you're doing, what you want to do will bring a lot of opportunities to you. When you do partner with someone, what does that look like? Are they bringing all the capital? You're bringing all the work? Are they bringing some of the capital? You're bringing some of the capital doing most of the work? What does that split usually look like? Well, I have four partners right now. So the first partner, we're 50-50 equity in our LLC. And then any money he has to purchase property, he's paid back the mortgage payment each month, the the principal and interest payment. And then he's 100% passive. He doesn't do anything except if I want to buy a new property, I ask him for more money (laughs) and he writes a check. But then my second partner that was a friend for two years, we're 50-50 everything. So 50-50 money. And then you know, up until recently, he did the maintenance and I did the property management, but now we have the property management company take care of that. So we have a duplex and a triplex, pretty much 100% passive. I just, if the property management company needs anything, I take care of that. And then I just input the owner statement into our, our bookkeeping. And then we did just buy a four units together that we're completely rehabbing. And I purchased the building with cash. And then he is pretty much uh, putting in sweat equity. So we're both working on the rehab, but he has a lot more knowledge and skill about construction and rehabbing than I do. So that's where he's really adding value. And then for all of our like material, we refinance, we're going to pay ourselves back. I've been using some of my cash and a line of credit I have to pay those. So we'll then we'll pay myself back and the, the line of credit back. And my third partner is uh, my brother. And that's just because I gifted him 25% ownership of an LLC that owns a small little duplex in it for Christmas one year. So he's 100% passive, has put no money in, but gets no money out as of right now. I just keep a little bit of uh, cash flow in the LLC account for now. But, uh, you know, eventually if I sold it or, you know, once I might give him a, some cash out of it or whatever, but I'd like to actually purchase a, another property to put into that LLC at some point. And then um, my fourth partner is my sister. When she graduated college, she wanted to um, move out. So I thought this is a perfect opportunity to house hack. I never got to do that. 
and we purchased a duplex. She went and got an FHA loan, so she only had to put three and a half percent down. Um, and she got a super low interest rate. So what we did was I paid for the down payment, the closing costs and any prepaid expenses like insurance and property taxes. And that came to like $14,000. I paid that where the mortgage is just in her name and we are 50-50 on the deed. So she currently lives in the upstairs and the downstairs tenant pays uh, pretty much all of her mortgage. She pays $50 a month towards her mortgage. So it's worked out. It's kind of a a long-term benefit to me that I will, whenever we sell the property, I'll get 50% of the proceeds from that. Whenever we, if she moves out, I'll get 50% of the cash flow from that property. But I couldn't have gone and bought this property really without, I didn't have enough cash to pay cash for it and do a burr. I didn't have enough to put 20% down at the time to buy this property. So it really worked to my advantage that I could become 50% owner of this property for such a low dollar amount of only the three and a half percent down. And then she just pays the utilities and only, you know, $50 a month, which is a huge benefit to her. It could probably rent for $750, $800 a month. So those are my four partnerships that each one is very different, but we all have a operating agreement and we have life insurance policies on each other. So if one were to pass away, the life insurance policy would be used to buy the the person's family out so we weren't stuck being partners with each other's family. And then we have LLCs together. There's so many different pieces of that whole explanation that I want to talk about. <laughs> uh, so I guess we'll first start with the house hack because that's a strategy that I'm actually looking to implement myself. And I think that's a really good way for a lot of people that are beginning to get started. I really like that strategy. So I want to talk through that a little bit. How did you go about the financing? Because in my experience, it's hard to get traditional financing on something like that when you're not married. So she just went and applied on her own. And we just asked the company if like the mortgage company, if it would be okay if I was on the deed and they said, yes, no problem. So I'm not, I didn't have to sign a single document for uh, the mortgage. Everything is in her name. And yeah, so then just the the de- our attorney when we closed on the property put both of our our names on the deed. So, you know, if she, you know, didn't make her payments, it would ding her credit, not mine. If the property was foreclosed on, the property would be taken away from both of us, obviously, but there would be no harm on, you know, it wouldn't ding my credit or anything like that. I don't foresee that happening <laughs> at all, but that's just like to kind of show how it would work out if that happened. And how did the down payment money work? And then I've also, I'm interested to hear more about the deed because I've gone through that process. I tried to do the exact same thing where I purchased the property and I was the only one on the mortgage, but somebody else was on the deed and our company wouldn't allow it. So I'm curious to hear more about that as well. I did a gift letter since it was going to be her primary residence. She could receive a gift in the down payment, which she doesn't have to pay it back. So it really is a gift. So I just had to sign a gift letter from the bank saying that I was gifting her the $14,000 and she did not need to pay it back. That was all we had to do for that, for those funds. And then I had to submit a bank account showing the $14,000 in, give them a copy of the check I wrote to her for the $14,000 and then it being deposited into her bank account. She had to show a bank statement showing that we just had to show a money trail of that gift. And then as far as the deed, I'm not really sure why they they let that happen. It's just an issue at all for them. But we do have attorneys here and I don't know if she kind of handled that for us or what, but it didn't come up as an issue at all. What type of bank did you use? Was it a small credit union, small portfolio lender maybe, or was it a larger, more reputable institution? It was first priority mortgage. I'm pretty sure they're nationwide because my brother, they're at least on the East Coast. And we had a a local loan officer here that our realtor actually referred us to. And we've used uh, him twice now, but it was first priority mortgage was the company. You mentioned that you have LLCs with them all. So when you're deeding that property, is it deeded to an LLC? Is that how you handle it? Well, I have to correct myself there. My sister and I do not have an LLC, actually. I just have an LLC with the three other partners, but it is in my name and my sister's name personally. And then we just have an umbrella policy for us together on for that property. And so the other properties, did you have any financing on those or were they all cash? 
I do have financing on some of those properties. I did find one really small local bank that would do a 20-year fix on an LLC property. I did do that with one of my partners, but then any other property we have in an LLC is a commercial property. And then I did just hear of a bank that will do a line of credit on an LLC-owned investment property. So right now I do have a line of credit on an investment property, but it's in my personal name. So this is the first bank that I've heard of that will actually do a line of credit on an LLC-owned investment property. And you've used lines of credit in the past to purchase properties. Were those unsecured lines of credit or were they secured with home equity from other properties? I've done both. So I have one property now that's free and clear that I have a line of credit on that I use it pretty much as my main funding source. And then I actually, with one of my partners, we are purchasing a property and we went to the bank to this commercial loan officer I had used before, established a relationship with, and had done a bunch of deals with him for my job too, and just talked with him. And I gave him a bigger pockets calculator report. And I said, you know, I'm looking for a way to purchase this property. You know, what, what do you have available? And he said, well, how about I give you an unsecured loan for 90 days purchase the property with that cash, and then you come back and refinance with us with some long-term commercial financing and pay off that 90-day unsecured loan. So we said, great, let's do it. So we had literally no cash out of pocket for ourselves. We used that unsecured loan to purchase it. We paid $800 ourselves to uh, put in a fridge and the property, we had purchased the property for $35,900. After we put the fridge in, we had the appraisal a week later and it appraised for $55,000. We were actually able to pull out like $41,000 from the property without really doing anything. Why was that a, a commercial property? Because it was in an LLC. Okay. And so, but was it a duplex? Was it a... It was a duplex. And so you were able to find a financial institution that was willing to lend on that small of a property using commercial financing? It's Cattaraugus County Bank. They're very small. I know they won't be out at you, but if anyone's listening that's local, we took out the mortgage of 41000 So it was more than the actual purchase price. Yeah. Usually a lot of banks won't do like under 50000 Yeah, that. And I've also... I've personally had trouble finding any banks that would be willing to do commercial financing on anything less than five units. And because, and oh, the reason, really? that, yeah, the reason you look for that is hmm. because commercial financing could be more flexible usually. But usually what I found is the size and also the number of units is they don't want to do anything less than five units. Yeah. So this bank is also the bank that would do a 20 year loan if you have an LLC. They would do it fixed on the residential side, but they've kicked me out of the residential side. So I was only able to do that once. And they're like, you have too many properties. You need to be on the, the commercial side. So that kind of stinks. But I don't know, maybe that's why they did that because they weren't taking me on the residential side anymore. But I did, I have had a couple other people use them, but I don't know if they were that low of a, a dollar amount. I think the whole part of this conversation is interesting because there's so many banks, there's so many institutions, there's so many mm -hmm. different places that you can get a loan from. And there's a lot that are going to be the same, but there's a lot that are different too. And so call around if you just call, 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 call. And it's a, it's a numbers game. And if you continue to call enough, you'll find someone that's willing to do the type of deal that you're looking to do in most cases. Yeah, I definitely agree that there's, there's so many options out there for different kinds of financing. I mean, especially that unsecured loan they gave us and then, you know, went and refinanced with them. I mean, who would have thought they would have given us this loan with no collateral and it worked out really well and we built a, a good relationship with them. So maybe that's what they look for too, is knowing that they'll they'll keep your relationship. Yeah, I'm sure they have been able to secure your business now going forward yeah. for at least some period of time. <laughs> So for someone listening to the show today that's a newer investor, they like a lot of the different strategies that we've talked about. What's the first thing that they should do when they're done listening to this episode to start building their real estate business? I would say get on the MLS and start running your numbers, practicing that. Yeah, even if you have ways to find deals off of the MLS, just use those properties on there to practice. Find out where you can get accurate property tax numbers from. Call people you know that have you know, rental properties in the area, get kind of estimates of what their insurance is on their properties or call an insurance agent and ask for a free quote. 
but practice running your numbers. Because when I first started, I did not practice enough. And like, I forgot no plowing to add on when I run my numbers. And in Buff, when you live in Buffalo, like that's a big expense to, <laughs> to forget about. But in overestimate your expenses and underestimate your what your rental income would be. But, you know, listening to podcasts, reading books, going on the Bigger Pockets forums, all of that is just great resources. But also find a local meetup. And, you know, even if it's a virtual one, you just having those people to inspire and motivate you. Like when I go to a meetup or even when I do a podcast interview, like afterwards, I am just so pumped up and energized. <laughs> Just from talking to real estate with someone who also loves real estate, it just, it's really motivating for you. And it's nice to have, you know, that person to connect with and to run numbers with or to ask questions or to get their feedback on something. And even just on Instagram, I think I'm on in like four mastermind groups or threads on Instagram just from people messaging me and like five other people saying, hey, do you want to like just talk real estate all this time in this message chat or, hey, let's do a a Zoom call every six weeks and just we'll pick a topic and talk about real estate. And usually everyone says, yes, let's do it. And now I'm in a a real estate book club that, you know, is meeting every two weeks. So just send out a couple messages to maybe some people you've already met online and maybe there's people that you want to meet and just talk to them, see if they'd be interested in in doing, you know, a little uh, mastermind group with you to to help you get started or, you know, maybe explain to them what your benefit would be to them too. You getting the benefit from this, explain how they can benefit too. So like for the book club, for example, like the benefit to me is that I have someone holding me accountable to finishing, (laughs) you know, my book because we picked the book Traction and there's like a lot of work to do while you read that book, like to help you put these systems in place and, you know, really go through your business. I would probably would just read the book and not actually do the stuff. So the, the book club hold me accountable to actually doing the action items in the book. Yeah. Gino Wickman, who wrote Traction, is a great guy. I love his, his content. I love a lot of his books. I actually had him on my other podcast, Millennial Investing. But yeah, no, I, lo- I love the advice about running the numbers because I think a lot of the confusion or just what holds a lot of people back is not being confident in what they're buying. I feel like if people were more confident mm-hmm. in what they were buying, they'd be willing to do it. Like They're committed they understand they want to buy real estate. They understand why they're doing it. They understand it's a good asset class to get into, but they're just not confident in themselves that what they're buying is good. And so I think if you practice and run those numbers and get really good at that, you start to become a lot more confident and then you're willing to actually just take the action and buy the property. So for me, when I first started, I was analyzing, I believe it was five deals a day, every day, five days mm-hmm. a week, just so I get comfortable. Straight off the MLS, I had no intentions of buying of any of those properties, but it didn't matter. I was running the numbers, quickly learning this is what you do, this is what you don't do, learning how to go about that. So I really do think that was great advice and a great thing for people listening to the show today to start as their first step. Yeah, thank you. And I, I think you can always you know, practice running your numbers. And then if you feel comfortable enough, send it to someone you know, who's an investor in your area. Email them your analysis, your report, and then you know, maybe the link to the MLS listing and just say, hey, could you take Five minutes of your time to just look at this and see if you, you know, anything jumps out at you, which is wrong. So I have a couple of investors in my area who do that to me. And it takes me no time at all to like look at something. Or, you know, if I think something might be off, I'll be like, I don't know, but look at your property taxes again. That just doesn't seem right. And you know, it takes me five minutes, not like I'm actually going and looking up that they're verifying that they put in the right property taxes. But just to get that, you know, second glance at something, they might be able to pull something out to help you do better at at analyzing your deals. Yeah, absolutely. I do the exact same thing. Ashley, for those listening today that have really enjoyed this conversation, want to go connect with you, where can they find you? The best place is on Instagram at Wealth From Rentals. And then I also um, am part of uh, the Facebook group, The Real Estate Rookie. I go live on there every other Thursday. And then you can also find me on the Bigger Pockets forums or send me a message there. Awesome. I will be sure to put links to all those different resources in the show notes so that everyone listening today can go connect with you there. Ashley, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. All right, guys. That's all I had for this week's episode of Real Estate Investing. I'll see you again next week. Thank you for listening to TIP. 
To access our show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.